Hello everyone. I hope everyone is doing good and all is well. Before we begin today's chat, I would like to apologize to you all for taking so long to drop another video. I had been celebrating my birthday. I had to move and just all kind of things. So I really do apologize for taking so long to drop one and I do plan to drop videos more regularly. And I do have some updates coming for you all on some videos that I have dropped in the past. And also, I would like to say thank you to everyone for the support on my videos, just for taking the time out of your schedules to watch my videos. Um, the Igbo Landing video is doing very, very well, and I really do appreciate the support. I mean, not only did you all watch, but y'all came through and showed out and commented, and I really appreciate you all, and I'm very, very grateful for it. So I just wanted to thank you all for that. And today's chat is going to be about the betrayal or massacre at Ebenezer Creek, about 20 miles outside of savannah georgia now on december the 9th 1864 an estimated 5,000 african-american lives were lost and you all are going to see why i said estimated once we get into the video because you know it's going to shock you a little bit but those lives included men women children you know small children teenagers and all of that and babies armed babies and they actually thought that they were on a march to freedom, and this march was called the March to the Sea, but they were actually on a march to the end. So, with that being said, let's chat. Okay, so, at the time of the Civil War, many slaves took advantage of the Union's invasion in the South. Now, for those of you who don't know, or those of you who haven't checked out my other videos, and yes, that will shade if you haven't checked out my other videos, because I do go over this in them as well. But anyway, I had to throw in a little shade and put in my little shameless plug. I'm sorry. But back to the story. Now, the Union, they were the northern states who were said to have believed in a unitary country free from slavery and based on equal rights. And the Confederates, they were the southern states who did not want to abolish or end slavery. Now, during the Union's invasion of the South, the slaves saw an advantage to declare themselves free and escape from the plantations. They finally had enough courage. And technically, they actually were free at that time. Now, they had been free since President Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation on January the 1st, 1863. Now, on January the 1st, 1863, President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation as the nation's approach to the bloody and horrible Civil War. Now, Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, it declared that all persons held as slaves within the rebellious states or and henceforward shall be free. So technically, the slaves, they were actually free at this time. Now, they were free, but they really had no sense of direction or any idea as to where they would go or what they would do next after they escaped from the plantations. Now, many of the newly freed slaves, they attached themselves to the Union Army troops who invaded the South in late, in late 1864. And they attached themselves to the to the troops because they looked at them, you know, as their protectors or they looked at them to, for protection. However, the troops, they only looked at the slaves as mere contraband of war. I know contraband. I'm thinking the same thing. Um, and now the former slaves, they were viewed as contraband because they had been previously property of southern plantation owners. I mean, but contraband, though. Wow. Now, before we get back to the story, I would like to fill you all in on a very interesting little fact. Now, after the Civil War was over, ironically, the Confederate slave owners, they actually sought out compensation for the loss or for their loss of losing their slaves, which they referred to as their stolen property. But back to the story. Now, the former slaves, they clung to the Union Army and they looked at them for protection against the Confederates who wanted to capture and kill them or return them to slavery. Y'all got to remember, this is still during the Civil War. So, of course, the Confederates, they still wanted to keep their slaves. So thousands of former slaves, they camped outside of the soldiers federal camps, you know, to get a little extra protection. 
Now, the former slaves, they clung to the army for protection, but they were also a very valuable asset to the soldiers as well. Now, the former slaves, they knew the land like the back of their hands. I mean, they had been there pretty much their whole lives. So, of course, with that knowledge, they were able to help the troops navigate and hide throughout the land. And also, many of the former slaves, they served as laborers for the Union Army. And they supplied the sweat and muscle, which kept General Jefferson C. Davis and his troops on the move with Major General William T. Sherman's 62,000 man army. Now, the former slaves, a.k.a. black pioneers, they cleared the roads and made them passable for the heavy wagons by removing the obstacles that the rebel troops placed in the paths of the army. Now, the former slaves, they also served as cooks, teamsters and and servants so i mean the soldiers they provided protection and food for the former slaves and the former slaves they provided their services to the troops so it was pretty much a give and take relationship and everyone was benefiting from the arrangement now it was a pretty good arrangement um in the beginning until the troops began to look at the former slaves as a burden now, they looked at them as a burden because although many of the former slaves provided services, of course, we know there were many who really couldn't. They were either too young to help out or physically unable to. I mean, they could not provide services. They pretty much couldn't help themselves, but they still looked at the troops for the protection and food as all of the others. Now, in the beginning, the soldiers, they had no issue with feeding the former slaves because food was plentiful at that time. But as time passed, um, the food, it became scarce. Now, the shortage of food, it actually was not the only issue that the troops had with the former slaves. General Davis, he was also a very unrepentant supporter of slavery. Or in other words, he supported slavery and had pretty much no remorse. He had a very short temper with the slaves as well. Um, he had a very short temper with the slaves because he looked at them as a burden because of the food. And he felt like they were actually slowing down his march. Now, General Davis, he was very eager to reach Savannah, Georgia, which was the destination of Major, Major I'm sorry, William T. Sherman's 250 mile destructive march to the sea. Now, this march was a march from Atlanta, Georgia to Georgia's coast. Now remember, this story is taking place during the Civil War. So the Union troops were still at war with the Confederate troops. I mean, they were actually in the enemy's territory by invading those southern states. And they had invaded the South. So of course, we can pretty much figure out what was going on then. And Major General Joseph Wheeler, now his Confederate cavalry, they were actually following the troops very, very closely. Well, they were following those Union troops very closely. And they were getting closer and closer and closing in on them pretty much. And of course, General Davis, he was blaming the slaves for them slowing him down. Now, this angered and worried General Davis, which was a very bad idea. Now, let me give you all a little more information about General Jefferson Davis, a.k.a. General Rebel. Or, I'm sorry, General Reb, my bad. But General Reb, and I also told you, now remember earlier I told you all that he was an unrepentant slave supporter. Well, he also loved battle. He was very short tempered. He was a proficient cursor, a cusser, because that's what the reports call him. So we're going to call him a cusser, too. And he had a very nasty reputation. Um, he and not only did he have a very nasty reputation, he was also known as infamous to some due to his feud with Union Major General William Nelson. Now, in August of 1862, when Nelson was in command, he and Davis got into a very heated argument over the defense of Louisville, Kentucky. Now, Nelson had ordered Davis to leave at that time. And, of course, um, from what it looks like in the reports, Davis went ahead and left. But a few weeks after that, the two men, they met again in a Cincinnati hotel. Now, when they met up, Davis demanded an apology from his superior, Nelson. Now, Nelson, he was a tad bit stubborn. So, of course, he refused to give Davison, Davis, I'm sorry, that apology. And when he did, Davis shot and killed Nelson at point blank range. 
Now, Davis was released and he was not charged. So there was a lot of questions about the event, um, but no charges were ever filed against him. And I want you all to keep that in mind as I tell you the rest of the story. But back to the story. Now, Davis, he was a very short tempered man, according to the reports. And his patience, like we said, was wearing thinner and thinner with the former slaves. Now, as the Confederate troops closed in on them, they were, well, Davis, he was pretty much heated at this time. And all of this was taking place during the last 25 miles that they had left in their march to the sea. So the troops, they were really hot on their tail at this time. So on December the 8th, 1864, the troops and the former slaves, they actually had reached the western banks of Ebenezer Creek at that time on this day. Now, when they arrived, they discovered that the bridge had been destroyed. And this was actually the only way across the icy 165 feet wide and 10 foot deep swamp. So this is a pretty big body of water to cross in the middle of December. So we know it was pretty icy and cold at the beginning of December, but we know it's pretty cold to step in those waters at this time. Now, the black engineers or the former slaves, they assembled a a pontoon bridge for them to cross across the icy waters. Remember, they were the laborers for the troops at this time. So they were the ones who actually took the time and assembled this bridge for them all to cross those waters. And by midnight, the bridge was finished and it was ready for them all to cross. Now, with the bridge being the only way across um, the, you know, it was 165 feet wide and 10 feet deep. So with that bridge being the only way for them to cross the icy waters, this is when General Davis saw an opportunity for him to get rid of the former slaves without punishment. And that's according to the reports. Now, he was sure that, you know, of course, if he got rid of the slaves, there would be some controversy for what he had planned next. However, he pretty much really didn't care. You all heard what I told you about him earlier. So he really didn't care because he was pretty much used to controversy. So um, it was said it was after midnight. So that brings us into December the 9th, 1864. So on December the 9th, 1864, Davis, he told the former slaves that there was likely to be a fight ahead of them. So it was best that the Negroes were ordered. Well, I'm sorry. The Negroes, they were ordered to not cross the pontoon bridge until after all of the troops and the wagons were across first because they were, you know, advised. Oh, it's best for you all to stay behind. We're going to have to fight and protect you all up ahead because they're going to be waiting on us. And when I say they, I'm talking about the Confederate soldiers. So this is what they told them. So they'll stay behind and let them and the wagons cross first. Now, although he had told them that, he also appointed guards to enforce that order. Now, the guards, they were really unnecessary because the Negroes, they were always obedient, patient, and very docile, according to Mr. Charles Kerr. Um, He was a a colonel within the... um, He was a colonel at this time, and he was not only that, but he was also an eyewitness to the events. Now, according to eyewitness Kerr, as soon as all of the troops and the wagons were across the pontoons, the orders were given to the troops to take the pontoons up and not let the Negroes cross. And of course, the troops, they did obey the orders that they were given. Now, as the troops, they stood safely across the creek. They had taken up the pontoons. So, of course, the Negroes or the former slaves or the black pioneers, as they called them as well, they were standing on the other side of this icy bank of water. Well, I'm sorry, this icy body of water. They were standing on the other side of the bank. And though it was from what the estimates say, it was anywhere from 5,000 to 10,000 newly free slaves that stared over those icy waters at them in fear as Williams' Confederate cavalry closed in behind them. As remember, they were hot on their trails. And so they were pretty much trapped between these Confederate soldiers and this icy body of water. Now, this group of former slaves that we're talking about, remember, they included men, women, children, and babies, pretty much armed babies. 
And according to the reports, like we said um, in the beginning, I did say 5,000, but that was the very conservative number. And that was what I was telling you all earlier, why I said an estimate. And what I was going to tell you, I was going to shock you. They actually estimate the number to be possibly between five and 10,000 people, well, former slaves who were at this site at that time. But back to the story. Now, I'm going to tell you all what the eyewitness Kerr, um, what he stated that actually happened next. Now, Kerr, he stated that I sat up on my horse then and witnessed a scene that like of which I pray my eyes may never see again. Now, according to Kerr, the former slaves cried out as Willard's scouts rode up from behind them and opened fire. The former slaves began rushing into the icy current to escape from the attack. And some of the Union soldiers, they were trying to push the logs over to the slaves, um, the ones who were attempting to swim through those icy currents. But of course, you know, you can't really swim too much through those type of icy waters. So many of the slaves um, who did not jump into the icy waters they were crushed under the weights of the stampede because, of course, we know the Confederate soldiers at that time, they actually rode horses and things of that nature. So they were a lot of the slaves were crushed and the ones who weren't crushed and those who did try to swim, many of them and pretty much the ones who jumped in the water, many of them slipped under the icy waters and they drowned. And those who did not drown and were not, you know, bold enough to fight back or anything like that are the ones who did fight back. Rather, they were either shot or captured and returned to slavery. Now, the Union soldiers who actually had felt sympathy for the former slaves, the ones who were attempting to push the logs over to them. The Confederates, while all of this was going on, they were also shooting across the banks at those soldiers. So with that happening, um, General Davis, he actually ordered the soldiers to get back in line and continue their march um, when they began to fire up on them as well. So they pretty much turned their backs to the whole situation and continued on their march to the sea to meet General William T. Sherman. Now, no one knows the actual number of the former slaves who lost their lives that day. But as we said, the reports estimated to have been as many as five to ten thousand. It's a very, very sad and unfortunate story. Um, But that brings us to the end of today's chat. And I want you all to tell me what you all think. Now, do you all think that it was just a very unfortunate accident um, that happened? Of course, I don't believe it was an accident because they took up the pontoon bridge. But do you all believe that they were actually betrayed by General Davis? That's what I'm going with, because what would be the reason to take up the bridge if you claim that you were going to fight ahead of them? It seems to me like General Davis knew that the troops were going to do exactly what the Confederate troops, that they were going to do exactly what they did. And to me, it's even more of a slap in the face that you had the audacity to have these free slaves build this pontoon bridge that they couldn't even cross to save them and their children but i want you all to tell me what you all think about the story down in the comments below please like the video please subscribe if you haven't already we're still on that climb to a thousand subscribers we really hope to get there soon thank you all again for all of the support if you would like to support in a monetary way or something like that the information to support will be in the description below And until next time, peace, love, and blessings.